Okay, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all and every one of you. This is In Conservation With. I'm David Lindo, also known as Jürgen Berda, and my very special guest tonight, sitting behind the world, or in front of the world actually, and maybe even on top of the world, is Ben Fogel. And I've actually, in honour of Ben, got my background to be as close to the Himalayas as possible. Um, not, quite, not very high, Ben, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you and where are you? So I am, I'm very well. I'm actually um, in London, fleetingly. Um, I'm actually about to head north um, up to the Scottish Islands. Um, there, there is obviously the rules of staying at home are very important, but actually for filmmaking and um, the, the film industry generally, um, as long as you're very careful with your COVID etiquette, we can still move around a little bit. So I'm actually, I'll be heading off um, almost straight after this, due north to the Hebrides, uh, a place that is, um, I mean, a, a, about as close to heaven as I can possibly imagine, really. Um, and the last year has been very strange, hasn't it? Oh, totally. How have you spent uh, the lockdown? So we uh, actually, the pandemic. We, yeah, we, we actually moved from London just before uh, lockdown happened. And we moved not too far. We moved to Oxfordshire. But we we suddenly had space, and it was serendipitous. It was it was kind of extraordinary timing because it meant that we did have access to outside space. And David, you and I will know the importance of this for um, for everyone. For wh wh whether um, whether you're strong of mind, whether you're strong physically, to actually have access to outside space, I think has been the only thing that's kept me going over this year, apart from my family. But like many people, I've I've struggled. This it's been a really tough year. It's been a tough on many different levels, but for me, actually having some access to the woods, being able to hear bird song has has been therapeutic. I think is how I would describe it. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I'm going to miss you not being in London because you and I know each other for for some time, and I've actually been to your house and hung out with your wife and kids. Well, actually, with your wife, actually, I think your kids were in bed at the point at that point, so uh, to move away, I mean, I'm sure it's good for you as well, but uh, I'm gonna miss you in terms of the potential bumping into you in Notting Hill and surprising I'm, I'm you. Getting you I'm, I'm, I'm dragging you out to Oxfordshire. My, the thing is, since, since um, uh, we moved out to the countryside, my kids are obsessed with birds. I mean, obsessed and seeds and growing. It's amazing kind of the transition that they've had. So believe me, you are a hero in our house, uh, and uh, and I think we'll be able to entice you out with some homegrown veg, David. Listen, I'll be there, definitely. Um, Zoomers, let me quickly tell you about Ben, for those who don't know, because there are a few people here who aren't from Britain, and I know you're you're globally known, but I, was, I think it's a good thing just to run through who you are and what you are. You are a broadcaster and a journeyman, as you put yourself down as, you're an adventurer. Um, you've rode the Atlantic, you've crossed Antarctica, you climbed Mount Everest. You are you are a passionate conservationist, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. And you are a patron for the UN, uh, a UN patron of the the wilderness, which we'll talk about as well. You've written ten best-selling books, including a few children's books, um, and you're watched by a ton of people on your TV programs. And I must admit, I actually have not seen anything of yours recently because I've been in Spain and unfortunately uh, Mr. Fogel hasn't reached here in a big way yet. Hablas Espanol, David? Un poquito, un, un poquito, un yeah. poquito. Because <laughs> you spent some time actually in a Spanish speaking country, you, you did mm. your, um, your, your, your sort of year out, your, yeah, your you, know, you know it was actually almost, your gap year. Like, almost three years in the end because one year became two and then I did a degree, so so I spent a lot of time in the Americas. Yeah, and you also did some work with turtle conservation, didn't you, in the, in Honduras and Nicaragua, Nicaragua even. How was that? It was amazing. It was you know I, what you must remember is I was nineteen. I, I grew up in West London, so you know our our um, kind of our, our territory in London, Labrook Grove, is where I spent my whole youth. You know, every, my parents moved to Labrook Grove, North Ken, when I was about um, seven years old or so. We moved from W1 in central London. So urban London 
was um, all I had really ever known. I, I had these extraordinary summers in Canada, but then to go out to the Americas, and when I say the Americas, I went to South and Central America, was just, I mean, it just blew my mind. I, I was so excited by the whole thing. And, and that turtle conservation work in Honduras and Nicaragua was my, my first um, foray into conservation. Dad's a vet, so I'd kind of grown up around animals, but these were domesticated animals. And, and working with wildlife was entirely new to me. It was, you know, wildlife was stuff that lived at the zoo. Where my father, in fact, that's what brought him over here. He became the, the vet at London Zoo. Um, so it was the first introduction into conservation and the, um, how, how do I put it, the controversies of conservation. Because here we had these extraordinary turtles, leatherbacks um, uh, and green turtles, and many others that were coming up nesting on the beach and local people were eating the eggs. Uh, so I started working with a charity, actually it was part of the Peace Corps in, in the United States. I'm not quite sure how I ended up with them, but they, they were doing a project to try and um, save these turtle eggs. But they were, obviously they didn't want to come into conflict with people, some of whom actually relied on these eggs. That was their only form of nutrition. So it was, it was, it was um, this careful balancing act between not ostracizing locals, not wanting to be the white Brit who came in and told people, don't eat those, uh, th those, um, those eggs. Uh, they need to be saved for, for conservation. I think it was a really good early lesson that our principles here in, in London, here in Great Britain, don't necessarily translate to other places, other cultures and other people. And it was the first time I really had to work with my diplomacy skills to try and kind of work a way around it. And, and we came up with a deal. The deal was the locals would take half the eggs and we'd keep half the eggs and, and they would be left in these nests and we would sit there to protect them because obviously locals were constantly going up and down the beach collecting them. Uh, so it, it was my first kind of insight into conservation and actually quite a point, you know, quite, quite a pivotal moment for me um, just to see the, the scale of the problem of us humans on this planet who have a naturally a, a, a significant um, impact. Yeah, so that's quite a sustainable kind of arrangement you came to there. That was pretty good. As a small boy, what was the young Mr. Fogel like? What was the young Ben Fogel like? Were you sort of hooked into the countryside then? Did you have a feeling that you might sort of end up in the world that you're in now? Because let's face it, your career on paper and seeing it on screen is the stuff of dreams for many people, you know. So how, how did you actually sort of get into that world? It's, David, it's the stuff of dreams for me. I have to pinch myself some, sometimes because the young me, the young Ben was fantastically shy. You know, I, I was, I, I, as I have already mentioned, I, my father's a vet. I grew up living above his veterinary clinic. So animals, dogs and cats, domesticated animals in particular, were my kind of life we, we had a house full of parrots we had you know there, there were all sorts of animals that would come through and and i wasn't because i didn't have any confidence it meant that i wasn't i i, I didn't have um that many friends if i'm to be honest so the dogs and the parrots were my best friends uh and the idea that one day i would actually kind of be in front of cameras performing i suppose if, if that's what you call it never crossed my mind. I, 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 I had no idea what I would do, but certainly what I've done didn't even come onto the horizon, let alone into my dreams. It, it wasn't something I ever envisaged. And how it happened was kind of by luck, but I suppose you create your own luck as well. And this is what I often say to people, that I, I think anything is possible if you really put your mind to it. And you also have to think outside of the box and I certainly can go in the front door that's that's the answer you know it's easy I, I often get people saying oh you only got into this because of you know your parents were relatively well known it was nepotism of course you got let in I I can assure you uh, there was a lot of hard hard graft and a lot of luck um, and um, and I I failed most of my exams I managed I fell in love with Latin America decided I wanted a, a life of travel and adventure 
And then when I was 23 years old, I, um, I wanted to find work for a travel magazine. I'm very dyslexic. And uh, I applied for Condé Nast Traveller, and I think I got the letters muddled up, and I uh, managed to, the, the letter went to Condé Nast Tatler, uh, a very posh magazine. I'm not quite sure what the magazine's for or who even buys it anymore. Um, you don't want to be too disparaging, but I was, it, it, it didn't suit me. It, it, it wasn't where I belonged, and I had some very good friends there. Um, actually, a lot of people have gone on to, to great things from that magazine. It's kind of extraordinary. I had an extraordinary year and a half um, and, and made some very good friends um, who've gone off into all sorts of different directions. But it was while I was in that office in central London that I saw, I opened up The Guardian one day and there was uh, an advert uh, looking for volunteers to be marooned for a whole year on a, a, an island. Um, I assumed this would be the Caribbean or maybe South Polynesia or, you know, so, some tropical place. Uh, and it soon transpired it was the Hebrides. All right. Um, and I, I kind of became the guinea pig in the very first reality show. I'm aware there's probably some youngsters watching here. This is not the way, th this is not a surefire way to get my career. I was lucky it was the right time, it was the right place. And it was, it, it really was serendipitous um, because reality TV didn't exist back then. It was, the year was 1999, so it's 21 years ago. No big brother no X Factor, I'm a celeb, none of those shows existed. So we really were pioneers, it was a whole year. A lot of people forget this. It's quite a long time to be part of a TV project, a whole year cut off from the outside world. So there was no, you know, there was no internet, there was uh, no cameras, no, uh, so apart from the cameras that we would record ourselves with, there, there was no way of speaking to family and friends, no phones, no mobiles, no internet no newspapers, radio visitors. We were isolated for a year. And the idea was to create a sustainable, self-sufficient community. So I think this built on that, that um, those lessons I'd learned on that conservation project in Honduras and Nicaragua, um, where we were actually seeing our footprint um, firsthand. We, we could actually see the effect, cause and effect, I suppose, living on that island. If we took too much food, we would see the impact that would have if we, killed too many of the animals that we had um, that we were rearing as in sheep and pigs and, and cattle then you know we, we, we would feel that effect and uh, and that was sort of I think that that was the tipping point that that opened a door to this extraordinary career but it wasn't it it, it, it didn't just fall into my hands I kind of if I'm to be honest I think one of my great prides is that I'm still here 21 years after appearing in a reality show. It's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to get 15 minutes. And uh, and I have, through hard work, I think through open-minded, um, uh, kind of uh, open-minded thoughts by being very careful about what I do and what I don't do, I'm kind of still here today. But what happened, and I will ask you, I, I'm aware, I, I, I'm just talking now. Sorry, David, this is your, uh, your chat, but I am. Um, but I also, um, when I started, I, I became kind of a daytime TV presenter. It was great. It was the early stages. I was, I, my first show I ever did was, was Countryfile. Um, and again, I suddenly found myself out in the countryside wearing a pair of wellies, starting to understand more about, you know, British wildlife and the British wilderness. And, uh, and, and I think that once again was another building block into kind of my real passion for the wild yeah i mean you look you were a poster boy or the original poster boy for reality tv and i think you know you probably launch a thousand chips in many respects in terms of people saying i want to be a reality star as well but the thing is the thing that you have that all those guys don't have you've got talent number one you know you're a national treasure basically so you you actually got talent and you are good at what you do and you're a very nice man and you come over beautifully come over you know you're a dedicated family man and it comes over beautifully and I think that's the difference because I think you're doing it for the right reasons you know you're not doing it to be famous as it were you're doing it to spread a message well you're you're David you're very kind thanks for flattering me that's um, true. But the thing, you know what 
I think the thing is, and you'll see this as well when you speak to youngsters and we've got Maya here and, you know, I, I look, for me, my role in life now is to kind of share my knowledge, share my passion and my inspiration with my own kids, but also others. And, and you know, I love the fact that you're also a, a, a huge advocate, not just of your subject, which, you know, is, is your great passion, but also to encourage other people to follow those dreams. But you must have it as well, David, the number of times you might do uh, a, you know a chat like this or outside of the time of covid when we could actually go into schools the number of kids that would be like i want to be famous like you what's it like being famous do you know what <laughs> being famous is a byproduct of following your passions and and doing things that you love and i think i've got quite a a, a simple philosophy really on on why some people make it and some people don't because you have to be authentic and you have to want it for the right reasons and there has to be substance to it and if i'm to be honest when i came off that reality show it was called castaway i, I was very famous but i was famous for nothing there, there, there was no substance there was no roots to it. i wasn't famous because i was a, a great ornithologist i wasn't famous because i was a great scientist who'd invented the vaccine for covid i wasn't famous because i was a politician or a great footballer i was just famous because my face had suddenly become recognizable because people had watched me messing around on this island for a year. So I think the 20 years since I was marooned on that island have been about me trying to put down roots and trying to actually find depth and substance to that fame and to put it to use and to, um, and to probably prove to people that I'm more than just a posh voice. Uh, you know, I think I think there's a lot of stereotyping that can go on in the world. I'm sure you and I could chat for hours about this. I think it's really interesting. And uh, and for me, for a long time, I had I, I had um, I kind of felt like I had to prove to people there was more to me than just this white posh boy who had been sent to a public school, for which I feel incredibly privileged. And uh, and I make sure everyone knows that I, I ha how lucky I was to get that amazing education. But I also feel I wanted people to see that I wasn't just a reality show tough. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think that's what's driven me with a lot of the things I've done, with a lot of the challenges and a lot of my um, kind of my my social work, if we call it that, my charity work, the, the, the work I do with youngsters to try and help them achieve their dreams and turn their dreams into plans because there's so many people out there and, it, and I find it really tough seeing you know especially COVID now it kind of breaks my heart to see how many youngsters and when I say youngsters you know we're gonna basically from the age of two up to the age of 25 are gonna uh, 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 life has just got that much harder uh, but I don't want people to lose hope and lose their um, aspirations and their dreams because I think now is the time that you David and me and some of the other great people that we know we have to stand up and we have to exactly. really help people achieve those dreams yeah talk about dreams when you get up in the mornings what drives you what's what's your motivation to go through the day I kind of I've, I've always been an optimistic person I think it, some people aren't sure if it's real some people don't like it you know th th there's this thing I think some people find eternally optimistic people irksome and annoying because they you know but i first of all i have my down days and first uh, uh, you know i definitely wake up in a grump sometimes and i sometimes don't even want to get out of bed but i think what motivates me you know when i was on that go this this sounds kind of cliched gap year hippie type of thing but when i was on that year i, I took a boat down the amazon it was, it was one of the early kind of big things i did three thousand miles down the amazon and there was a there was a, a Brazilian there who, who spoke uh, a bit of English. I didn't speak any Portuguese, so he was the only person I could chat to. And he 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 one day he told me I've I, I've always lived with by this um, by this uh, kind of quote to add life to your days, not days to your life. And I was told that when I was about eighteen years old, and I've never forgotten it. I think so many people look at it. It depends how you look at life. Is it a journey or a destination? Now, if we all have this idea that it's this destination which a lot of people do it's retirement and it's going to spain uh, and it's uh, going to the beach every day and and uh, drink, drinking sangria and margaritas and playing golf all day now for a lot of people that is the shangri-la that we're all working towards and it's an end goal and it's a destination 
to which you have to slave through the journey. Well, you know, what a waste of life if, mm. if you're gonna if you're going to overlook the fifty years, sixty years, I don't know what's retirement now, I don't think any of us are doing. If you're gonna if you're gonna kind of suffer through that whole period, to what end and what have you made of life? So I've always kind of I try to remind myself that that every day is the journey and life is the journey, not the destination. Yes, let's hope that there'll be a very sweet destination that we can all enjoy. Uh, but let's actually try to enjoy every minute. And then I, I see my kids who are my proudest thing on earth. If you ask me now to define myself, it's as a dad, the adventurer, journeyman, traveler, presenter, that's, that's a kind of, that's my job. <laughs> that's how uh, I'm able to, um, you know, protect and nurture and provide for my for my kids but a dad is my most important thing but also it goes beyond that it's not just about my own children I've realized I'm in a privileged position I've I've been able to earn a very good living for the last 20 years and you only need to travel um, you know a bit around this country and beyond and, and and overseas to realize just how lucky many of us are and 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 I really do Again, don't want to sound cliched, but I really want to try and make a difference elsewhere. So I think when I'm in the morning, when I'm looking in the mirror in the morning, apart from looking at how, how tired my eyes look, and uh, and uh, and how much I, I am looking forward to going away again, you know, on a proper journey, I um, I just think about making the most of every minute, and that's what we did with lockdown. By the way, I don't want to dwell on it because I'm sure lots of people are here to escape the dreaded lockdown word, but. You know, I saw it like an inverted adventure. So rather than just think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to climb the walls. This is terrible. And, you know, I usually travel a lot. I, I probably go to about 90 countries a year. Terrible carbon footprint. We can get onto that later. But it's the reality of my job. Suddenly to be at home for, uh, you know, probably 90% of that time was an inverted uh, and very different experience. I, I've spent more time with my wife and my kids this year than almost their entire lives and my entire relationship with my wife it sounds terrible but it's kind of always how we've lived and we've made it work and we just learned loads of new skills we started you know doing doing stuff together so it's yeah anyway that that's what i kind of that's how i get through the day yeah because i was watching all your stuff on instagram it's it's amazing you put a picture of your dog up and there's like ten thousand people liking it it's incredible the amount of people that actually follow your every move um I want to talk about adventure because when I, you know, people think about, oh, I want to be an adventurer, it sounds amazing. I know for a fact for myself that, you know, I love traveling. I travel to a lot of places too, but I like my comfort. I want to stay in a hotel. I look at your face and the battered up, your battered up face when you went up to, uh, to the man, climb Mount Everest or, you know, walking across the Antarctic or rowing across the Atlantic. And I'm thinking, nah, uh, I can't do that. What goes through your head? Do you get moments when you think, what the hell am I doing? Absolutely. You know, but that's part of the, that's part of the draw, to be honest. You know, if you think about travel, if you think about it, and I, I'm sure you'll appreciate this, a lot of the best part of travel is anticipation and reflection. So it's the planning and the preparation, and then it's all the stories you can tell uh, to your mates in the pub or around the dinner table. And actually the doing often is miserable. You know, you've got the number of times I've had diarrhea on trips and you've been caught short and you're, you know, you're not necessarily enjoy, enjoying it. There's mosquitoes everywhere. There's bed bugs, cockroaches. You know, we've all experienced those moments uh, when you, you're in a, in a far away place that's very different to what you know. But that is where the attraction is because I think sometimes you can't appreciate what you have until you have perspective. And for me, it's really important to have perspective on every aspect of my life. So not just um, absolute living conditions, which you know you need to go to you know a, a favela in Rio de Janeiro, and you, I can compare to, to the life that I have here, and that's a very obvious way to see how lucky I am and how the majority of the world live and where we need to focus time and attention. But for me, actually, by enduring and suffering is is another way to appreciate life and perhaps prepare for the unexpected um I, I kind of it's almost like every five years i force myself to endure so it started with a year on that island and it wasn't an endurance but it was hard 
you know, we were cut off, as I've mentioned, from everything. And a year on that island, away from loved ones and family, certainly wasn't easy. I loved the experience, but I definitely kind of endured uh, to an extent. And then that has gone up incrementally from to rowing to, to the race, uh, actually a race across the Sahara Desert called the Marathon Bay Starb, which is seven marathons in seven days, then to the row across the Atlantic, then across Antarctica, a thousand miles on skis, and then across the empty quarter with camels, and then culminating about two years ago with Everest. And yes, there's certainly moments there when you're like, why am I here? Because it's so, totally self-induced. You can't blame anyone. If anything goes wrong, it's it's on my uh, you know, it, it, it's on my shoulders. You you stand or fall by your own mistakes and your own judgment. But I think that's what makes you stronger. I, I, I'm a firm believer in risk. Risk is probably a word that we have completely abstained from for the last year. Isn't it? If you think about it, it's kind of interesting that risk has become entirely extinct. It's an endangered word because we can't take any risks when it comes to COVID. Now, that's a statement. That's not necessarily... That, that, that is the overall kind of picture I'm doing. I'm not, we're not going to go into COVID because everything now, David, is politicized. Isn't it amazing? We can't even talk about something like COVID without getting into a, a political thing. Debate, about yeah. will be, there will be people of, of, of on both sides. I, I've tried to stay measured with all of my sentiments. I try to be open-minded and sit on the fence. But if we think about risk, risk is something, it, it's really interesting, isn't it? My wife is talking about it. If I, I could now, go and uh, get in an aeroplane and I could go up to uh, 10, 20,000 feet and jump out of that aeroplane uh, with a wingsuit on and very possibly die. And I'm totally allowed to do that. I, I'm, uh, you know, that the, there are certain risks we are allowed to take, but when it comes to COVID, because obviously your the, the impact that jumping out of an aeroplane might have would only harm you, COVID, has, people I'm, I'm kind of you, you you understand i'm kind of waffling on a little bit but you understand my sentiments that risk is something i think we all have to embrace and i think one of the hangovers of covid is going to be that people will still be very 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 cautious and that saddens me a little bit because i think sometimes you have to embrace a little bit of risk and i'm not saying covid risk but a little bit of risk in other areas to grow yeah are you afraid of death I'm, do you know I'm not afraid of death, but I'm afraid of uh, I'm afraid of how my death would affect my loved ones, and that terrifies me because when I think of that as a child, that was my biggest fear: something happening to my parents. So I'm not scared of death at all. Um, it's weird, isn't it? Maybe because I've always lived to add life to my days, and I've added so much life to my days that genuinely, if something happened tomorrow, I've kind of I I, I could kind of nod and go, "Do you know what?" I did as much as I could. I kind of, I lived that life. But what terrifies me is those that love me, those that I would be leaving behind. And that really does leave me fearful, which meant, meant when I climbed Everest, that was a big deal because, you know, there was and still is very real risks there. You know, you, I'm sure you'll have read those headlines that say, oh, it's no longer a challenge. You know, you're dragged up by some poor Sherpas who don't want to be there and it's a rich man's thing now. You pay a huge amount and just get dragged up. Well, you know, it's a bit of a cliche. There's some truisms there, um, but the reality is it's still a very dangerous mountain. It, it, it involves a lot of hard work and it is a risk, you know, that I think the, the, the figures have gone down now, but there was a one in nine, you know, a, a, a one in nine, one in 10 um, death rate on that mountain, which is, is something not to be sniffed at, especially when you have young kids. And for me, it was weighing up the pros and cons. What would my children get out of me following my dreams? And it was a big family discussion. It wasn't something I took lightly. And, and we've always discussed everything as a family. You know, what, what, as soon as you have kids, as soon as you have a wife uh, or partner, who, uh, I, I think you you have to share um, you, you have to share your decision making with them. And unanimously, my, my family kind of wanted me to 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 try for this this mountain that I had dreamed of climbing ever since I was a little boy. I tell you what, I'll be one of those uh, one or two in the ten that would die because. I've been to Cusco in um, Peru, which is like probably just a little hill compared to the uh, Himalayas, and I was suffering majorly. I couldn't breathe, and it was just awful. I didn't you enjoy it. 
did you have to have some extra oxygen? No, I just had that tea stuff and I just basically stayed in bed, tried to breathe, basically. Massive, so. massive day, Cusco. Cusco, I mean, Cusco is an interesting one. I've, I've been lucky enough to go many times. The thing about Cusco is you can get there very quickly, which is probably what you did. I don't know if you took yeah. the bus. Um, but if you if you fly there, you're suddenly you're going almost from, especially if you go from Lima, you're going from sea level up to a very big height. And it's the same. A lot of people experience that with Kilimanjaro. You know, the, the, it, it's this rapid ascent, which just knocks you out. But if you take things really slowly and this is, you know, th th this was the very unsophisticated way that I climbed Everest very, very, very slowly. I just really respected um, the altitude because that is the killer. And I did it as slowly as I possibly could. And I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I was successful with that summit bid. Yeah, okay. Um, you've traveled to many countries. Um, if I came from another universe, because basically when you look at the, uh, the news, all you see is conflict, war, you know, all sorts of stuff going on. But if I came from another universe and said, Ben, what are people like on planet Earth? You've been around. What would you say? Wow, that's, good. that's a really good question, David. I kind of, I think generally we're good. We're good people. I think, you know, if you look at, if we look at, you know, a simple medium that I think lots of, lots of people tuning in today will be aware of social media and you'll be aware of trolling and, and people who are mischievous, who try to cause chaos and damage and bullying and, and we hear a lot of that and you only need to open the papers read uh, read magazines watch television there's there's a lot of kind of swirling anger but is it and and i actually think that the default human nature of humanity is kindness and and i certainly see that with my travels yes of course there's a lot of war there's a lot of conflict there's some awful things going on syria or celebrating you know an awful decade or so today of, of of awful warfare as are you know many other wars raging around the world but actually when you look at the population of what are we up nearly seven billion i think the default is that humans are good people we care about one another we're community spirited i've i, I in all my travels i've probably experienced 99 percent positive kind interactions with everyone i've met and encountered and one percent um kind of negative which i think you'd get anywhere so i think if you came down as an alien yes if you drop into whitehall if you drop into um almost any political arena or uh, uh you know and and certain volatile countries which have kind of just lost their law their, their lawlessness of course you're going to see you'll see the trolls of humanity but i think by and large if you dropped into if you dropped into a little community in uganda uh, you know a, a tiny little uh, community away from uh, any big cities i think you would only find kindness and humility and smiles and happiness that's that, that, that I, I could be wrong there but that that i think is is how i would describe it yeah have you got a favorite continent that you like exploring well it's it start it certainly started with south america um i spent so much time out there i i found the andes such an exciting part of the world with the volcanoes and the the, the culture up there i found really exciting the wildlife the jungles um the the diversity of cultures and then when i was about 25 i i visited africa for the first time i went to zambia uh, on a walking safari and I got I was just captivated from there and uh, except for this year uh, last year how I lost track of which year we're in but uh, outside of the time of COVID I I'm lucky enough to get back to the African continent in general probably about a dozen times and uh, and I just I love it there I could quite happily I say there it's a it's a great continent with lots of very individual nations uh, but there are, you know, the, Ethiopia is one of my favorite places. Uganda that I just mentioned just ha have had some extraordinary experiences there. Tanzania, Kenya. Um, so I think I think it, I'd have to probably um, go for Africa because because of the extraordinary diversity, the wildlife, the people, the cultures, the landscapes. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's one of the. In fact, Africa is a continent I've not been to that much. Actually, I've been to Ethiopia, Kenya. South Africa and a couple of countries in North America. 
And what did you think of Ethiopia? I loved it. I, the people are so lovely. I remember one occasion we were surveying for some birds in southern Ethiopia and I was given some peanuts and I hate peanuts. And I saw this kid nearby, so I, I offered him the peanuts thinking he'd run off. But he got his little sister, his two little sisters, and he gave them the food first before serving himself. It was like, I was like choked. And another time I was in Addis Ababa in a restaurant and I was having some food and I just happened to be aimlessly gazing in a direction and this guy thought I was looking at him. He's eating on his own and he got up and I was thinking, oh no, I'm in trouble. He came over to me and he says, do you want some of my food? And I said, oh, uh, no, no, it's fine, thank you, sorry. It was just beautiful. They are beautiful people and it's such a shame that they are now rocked in conflict as well. Mm -hmm. At least part of the country is. You've, um, you've written 10 books, as we mentioned earlier. Um, how the hell do you find the time in between climbing mountains and swimming and rowing and, and whatever to write a book or 10 books for that matter? I've always got a computer with me. So wherever I go and there's long journeys, you know, all, all that travel um, uh, takes a lot of boats and trains and planes and cars. And as much as I love looking out of the window, I find I find myself getting inspired by the landscapes I'm in. So I've had a lot of bouncy bus journeys with my computer on my lap, bouncing around, sitting in a tent. And it's kind of how I fill those times. I think it's how I don't suffer homesickness, you know, because I really miss my family when I go away. But when, when there are kind of long evenings on my own, especially if I'm filming in a far away remote place where there aren't other people to socialize with, I, I I've always found that words are quite a good way of a, a, a good form of escapism. So during lockdown, I wrote a book um, uh, called Inspire, which was sort of a, an anthology, a catalogue, I suppose, of lots of the journeys and experiences I've had. And I've tried to kind of translate them in some way into everyday language so that people can use them to use some of those examples to kind of help them through the trials and tribulations of everyday life back here in, in the British Isles or, or, or certainly kind of in a urban life. But writing's been something I've always loved. My father has written a hundred books. So I, it may sound impressive, but I'm a long way behind him. I've got uh, quite a few to go till, uh, till I catch up with dad. Yeah, as a kid, I used to be, I mean, I was gregarious in a way, but I, I used to secrete myself away to watch birds and for me, being in that kind of environment, in an urban environment, because that's where I was, was my sanctuary. And I get the feeling from you that, you know, you said you were a bit shy as a kid. Do you think that that shyness still exists in you and part of you sort of getting away from, from dealing with people sometimes is to go off into the remote wilderness and have these adventures? Is that a, a good yeah. sort of summary of why you do things? I think so, yeah. I can't wait to get to the island tomorrow. Uh, there'll just be a, a tiny group of people, you know, there's a very small little tight group of people. I mean, funnily enough, lockdown has given us all a, you know, a, a, everyone's had kind of time to themselves. And I think some people have really enjoyed it. I think some people will actually find it quite scary, kind of having to reintegrate and re-socialize. I think it's actually one of the hurdles we have, one of those hangovers that we're gonna have to really try to, um, get on top of because we are social creatures and I do like being around other people but if you ask me now what my dream kind of life would be it would, I'm very envious of those often bearded men who live in cabins in remote forests and woods there's something there's something rather romantic about just moving there and chopping wood and cooking my own food on the stove and growing everything um, in a in a little organic vegetable patch and that does kind of that, that that does interest me but what i've discovered over the years i always thought when i became a dad and had a family that we would move away and do that ourselves but i think i think socialization for kids is so important i i think we've all had a little taste of home education i'd always coveted it before and hoped that i would have a chance to do it until i did and then i realized how heroic teachers are uh and i also realized the importance because actually my kids actually missed their friends as much as they missed their schooling and their teachers. Uh, and it's that socialization that I think I've been reminded is so important for, yeah. um, uh, for children to have, just to build those skills of being 
kids and messing around and being silly that that parents they can do that around us but we don't find it as hysterical as their their kind of their contemporaries do and also it's important for them to form friendships you know because some of those can be lifelong as well can't they i remember watching i remember watching you on um, one of your series when you went um into a forest i think it might have been in romania and you met a couple um the man was substantially older than the, than the woman and I found that it was really fascinating, actually, you being with them, because I found their, their dynamic really kind of odd. Um, and it, it felt as if he was, I think he was Australian. Mm -hmm. And I think that he, I, felt, I got the impression that he was quite happy doing his stuff, you know, living sort of off the grid. But I felt that she wasn't so happy doing that at all. They were an amazing couple, Mir Miriam and Peter. And actually, they, so I visited them a couple of years ago now, and they're now back in New Zealand, I believe. He actually had a health scare. And, you, and you're right, there was a, a kind of quite a yawing, obvious age difference. But actually, they were, they, they actually both genuinely loved this nomadic, perpetual uh, movement of existence that they had. They were camping every single night in different places, moving around. And actually, I thought, I actually found them quite an inspiring couple because it kind of, it proved to me that actually sometimes, you know, slightly different uh, chalk and cheese, yin and yang can actually work really well together. And I thought they created a rather kind of beautiful harmony with the landscapes all around them. It, th th theirs was a very different existence to lots of the other people who are more rooted. They, they were one of the uh, of the series that we were talking about, New Lives in the Wild. In fact, there's there's one on in about an hour's time of Return to the Wild. It's, it's actually less, it, 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 this one is a little tamer. It's down in Devon, uh, a great family called the Masons. So, and it's not quite as exciting as some of the overseas ones that I've done, but actually there's a relatability, I think, to the ones done in the UK. But I digress. New Lives in the Wild I've done for nearly a decade now, and, and I've visited nearly 80 couples and individuals and families, and they, um, each of them has ha, has been very different, but they've all sort of had similar motivations and they all have a similar sort of return of happiness because these are people who've decided to drop out. So they've, they've woken up and decided, you know what, New York, London, Manchester, wherever it is, isn't for me anymore. And they've all embraced a, a very different type of lifestyle, but they most of them have, have been rooted but there's a few kind of nomads who are perpetually moving around and that actually quite i, I get quite excited by visiting those individuals yeah sounds great um you're involved in a few charities and ngos you're a patron for example of wilderness which we'll talk about in a second but we are both patrons of the british hedgehog preservation society in fact when they approached me when i saw your name there i thought despite there was another name that i wasn't so sure about when i saw your name i thought i'm in it so i was there and um, tell us about the wilderness so the world, well, so um, the United Nations patron of the wilderness. Do you mean? Yes. Yeah. So that that came about a few years ago, um, and I had been working with the UN Environment Programme uh, with uh, a South African called Lewis Pugh, who does a lot of um, big open water cold swims uh, to try and raise awareness for the, uh, for the oceans, plastics, conservation in general. And, uh, and they asked me if I would, uh, if I would take on a role um, as their patron of the wilderness. So what does that mean? And a lot of people keep asking. I suppose it's, I'm a champion of the wilderness. So I, I'm incredibly lucky and, and privileged that I get to visit so many wild, truly untouched places. And there's not very much wilderness left on this planet. It, uh, especially in the British Isles, you know, it's it's almost uh, as it, uh, 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 it's almost as endangered as as the word risk. Um, and the role involves meeting senior politicians all around the world, sharing my own experiences. So climbing Everest, for example, was uh, in part um, the, the climb was as patron of the wilderness, so that I could actually go back and report to the UN um, environment program that's based in uh, Nairobi in Kenya and actually kind of report back on the impact humans are having on that mountain. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you didn't need to go. You could just hear from uh, people existing uh, who, who are climbing there anyway. But everything I've done has been about immersion and understanding myself. We know already that getting information for uh, secondhand uh, 
is is already um, going to tarnish the truth. And truth is an interesting thing right now. It's again, it's becoming uh, endangered, isn't it? It's because David, you have your truth, I have my truth. There's there's lots of truths out there, and it can all get muddied. And I find it fascinating when, you know, I, I, I'm. I'm an advocate of electric cars. Every time I mention electric cars, I guess a flurry of people and a queue, a flurry of people now going, no, electric cars are terrible. You have no idea how much more damage electric cars are doing than diesel cars. That's their truth. This is my truth. And it's the reality is it's not a, it's not anyone's truth. It's opinion. And, and I think sometimes we have to choose the least worst option. I'm digressing again, but I think it's it's just quite an interesting kind of time that we're in that actually opinion is under threat because if you have a, an opinion on many many different things um whether it's global warming uh, an opinion on what impact we're having on the environment uh whether you say you're green uh whether you uh, say that you advocate electric cars all of those are so politicized and have such uh, extreme opinions on the left and the right it means that actually the the ability just to have a sane, open-minded conversation is almost lost. Um, and, and, and it's one of the, the things that I kind of want to fight for. So going to Everest, I wanted to experience it firsthand to not just read the headlines that say there's rubbish everywhere. So here's the thing, what, what do you think? Do you think Everest is covered in rubbish? I don't know. I mean, I've seen pictures. There you go. So but, but if you read the paper, if you read the papers, they will call it the, the 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 largest rubbish tip in the world. Well, I'll set the record straight. I've never seen a cleaner mountain in my life. Those the people there, the Sherpas who who live up at high altitude, are, are so respectful of their landscape. And yes, like any mountain area, there is an impact when people come. There's there's poo on the ground because there aren't loos and it's not easy to take stuff away. But they over the last twenty years. The Nepalese have done an astonishing job at tidying that mountain. Now, if you go up to Camp 4, there are some tents left around. There are a couple of old uh, bits of kit from where people have died and it's never been collected. But that, that is the heritage of the mountain. It's like when you go to Antarctica, you could look at Scott and Shackleton's hut that were left behind when, when they perished that was never taken away. People could say, look at that rubbish, all that rubbish left by humans. Actually, if you go to the huts, and I have been, they are beautiful. They make you want to cry. They're so beautiful because they are a connection to our ancestors who, who did these extraordinary journeys. Well, the same for me goes to Everest. When you see some of the litter that is there, which is largely kind of tents and kit that's been left. And, and listen, it, uh, it's not perfect. There is bits of litter, but I have seen, I see more litter in the British countryside. I see more litter in the national parks here. I see more litter in the parks the, the, in, in London. We, we used to live very close to you near um, Wormwood Scrubs. I see more litter in that park every day than I saw on Everest. So I always find, I, I find it a bit rich when newspapers are going, look at Nepal, they don't care about the mountain because the Nepalese took that really hard and found it, found it deeply disrespectful. So when I wrote a piece for The Guardian and I came back, I got a letter that's framed now in my loo from the Sherpa Association saying, thank you for the, it feels like we've won the lottery. Finally, someone has reported the truth. And, and that's kind of, that, that's kind of what, that motivates me, David. It's why I do what I do so I can actually go. Now, people can still disagree and, and there will be people saying, well, no, I think there's still more litter. Or when I was there, I saw um, more litter. Everyone can have that opinion, but I can share with comparisons of being in other places and mountains that I think relatively it's a very clean mountain. So that, that's kind of what drives me and that's part of my role as patron of the wilderness. Okay, any young kids watching this video in the future, what advice would you give them if they want to follow in your footsteps? Uh, be creative. Um, so, you know, reach out to you, to me, <laughs> cue a flurry of people. It won't necessarily happen, but be creative. Think about people who are working in a similar medium. Uh, think about people that you might be able to, to um, uh, get some apprenticeship work from. Uh, ha hands up before everyone kind of starts, starts getting in touch. I genuinely, the work I do is so far away and so complicated that actually apprenticeships don't work with me right now. But that's something that may well change in the future, and I hope it does, because I'd love to give people, um, some, some youngsters, a, a foot up. But I think it's about being creative. I think it's about really being passionate, learning. I think it's about embracing 
you know, the, the modern exciting world. Back 20 years ago, television was the only medium. What we're doing now was, you know, it was a pipe dream. How could you create your own content in your own show? But David, you're kind of proof just with, with this and, and, uh, and, and everyone else who's doing great podcasts and, and uh, vlogs out there that actually you, if you're passionate enough, you will shine through. Believe me, you, you, I, I've worked in the television industry. If you're good and you, uh, you can engage with people and you can do things well, you, you will be noted and people, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. So, you know, it's why I find it quite exciting that all these um, YouTube stars are rising to the top. You know, their, their star is far higher, far greater than mine. I might get a few TV viewers, but it's nothing compared to what you can get on YouTube. And that I find really exciting. I'm an old fogey. I, you know, we struggled for, to even get me online. I had to borrow my wife's computer because I didn't even get mine going. I'm really feeling my age now. But there's a lot of people, you know, who really know how to use social media and uh so i think it's a combination of real passion and you really do have to be passionate about it but you know nature wilderness the wild adventure these are all areas that are not going to go away they're going to become you know the the, the the world is at tipping point you know i think most people watching this will probably agree that that things are happening and that we need to we we need to um challenge ourselves and now more than ever we need young ornithologists we need young adventurers and explorers to 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 be passionate and to uh, step into the shoes of those like you and me who, who who have you know been on the screens for a little bit it's not that it's time to hand over i'm not really I'm not really ready to do that just yet but i'm certainly uh, ready to champion others and and to help you know help get other people out there what about older people because i've always felt i mean i came to my professional kind of stuff quite old do you can older people suddenly say right i'm shaking off the shackles of my nine to five i'm in my late 40s and my 50s and i'm gonna get out there and, and do stuff can, can is it possible for them to do that too well it depends what what in what form you're saying, I, mean, I don't know if you're asking whether that in terms of kind of doing it um, in broadcast terms or just because they're passionate about the subject. But more about passion. I, th I think, you know, now, now is, I, I think accessibility to amazing literature, TV shows about nature that you and the great Attenboroughs make has, has never been better. So I think access to exciting places where you can go and watch the wonders of nature and wildlife here in the uk by the way you know we can see some amazing things here i think has never been more accessible and i think a lot of travel companies are realizing that i think a lot of people are realizing the benefits of you know taking on a big walk walking from john o'groats to land's end and and just kind of getting a bit closer to the outdoors so yes very much so i think if you know my father-in-law actually my, my wife's father he, he actually came to ever he, he retired the day uh that i set off to climb mount everest and he actually came out to i invited him to come he's a doctor uh or was a doctor until he retired and i actually invited he age 70 i invited him to come and join me all the way to base camp uh, so base camp is nearly 6,000 meters. So we're talking probably three times the height of Cusco. Uh, and my 70 year old father-in-law came all the way there walking sheer, sheer um, slopes to get up there. And he did it. And I, and, and I kind of see that as a fantastic motivator though. Don't you think, you know, yeah, it is. I do that age, 70. you know, he was fit and healthy, but I think the fact that he did that and he's still talking about it years afterwards, uh, I think more and more people, and especially as we come out of COVID and a lot of people, especially the elderly have been isolating and, uh, you know, really, we've obviously all been isolating, but they've really been isolating. And maybe this is the time to, I think we might suddenly see, uh, I, I, you watch David, you're suddenly gonna see a lot of headlines about the number of 70 year olds suddenly rowing oceans and climbing mountains. I think it's going to create I think there's going to be a lot of uh, old children or young <laughs> adults out there, young grandparents uh, out doing crazy things. I, I hope they are. Yeah, so do I. I've got two very difficult questions for you now. What is your favourite mammal? Limey. Um, I mean, you're going to be really bored by this, but I love dogs. I, I kind of figured that. 
Yeah, I mean, dogs <laughs> Dogs have just been a really big part of, of my life. I think it's growing up with, with a, a father as a vet. I've always had dogs. It's how I met my wife. So dogs, for me, I, I kind of love the fact that humans have worked with an animal over a great period of time to habituate them and that the relationship is truly symbiotic. I think you could argue a lot of other relationships with domesticated animals are one way. <laughs> I'm not sure the relationship with cows really works for the cow. Um, <laughs> but I think the relationship with a dog, genuinely, the dog loves us. It loves being with us. And as much as some militant animal rights people sometimes say, no, people shouldn't keep animal uh, dogs as pets, it's unfair. I, I really do disagree with that. I genuinely think dogs love being with people. They're loyal, they're, they're loving. And, and I've, I've always, I've, I've, I'm fascinated by kind of um, social anthropology anyway. So the notion that humans have worked with dogs in various capacities and that chihuahuas were used by wealthy royalty to sleep on the beds to attract the, the bed bugs and the fleas away from them. <laughs> Uh, I love and bloodhounds are now used by anti-poaching patrols in uh, in Kenya. I, I kind of I just love the diversity they're being used to sniff out COVID in people. I just think the the diversity of dogs and how we work with them is is kind of marvelous. Fantastic. If you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be right now, Ben? I th I mean. If I could be anywhere now, I mean, I love the ocean, so I'd love to be by the sea somewhere, almost anywhere, on it, in it, under it, somewhere by the ocean, hearing the, the waves crash on a, a beach or a shoreline. Um, and I think I'm going to have to go for, do you know, I love Iceland. I was lucky enough to go actually last year for my show, New Lives in the Wild, and uh, Iceland, I just think, is amazing. Yeah, it is. Fantastic place. Okay, um, Zoomers, just to let you know that on Thursday we've got another giant this week. We've got two giants this week, Ben, and then Margaret Atwood. So please tune in for that. That should be a very interesting evening. Um, ben, you are, I mean, I'm so happy I met you. I've actually, I, we actually know each other. And by the way, I need to publicly thank you for the barber jacket you sent me um, last year. Or was it? Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. But, um, We've known each other for a little while. I'm looking forward to coming to Oxfordshire to hang out with you, take you guys out birding and reconnect. It'll be fantastic. Thank you. I know you're so busy. It's taken me a year to tra track you down practically. Thank you so much for making the time. I know you're a busy man. So we appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. And sorry. No, listen, thank you. I'm a massive fan, uh, David, and everything you do I find incredibly inspiring. So uh, I can't, can't wait to actually uh, go out and, and uh, see what we can find uh, once lockdown is over. That would be amazing. Zoomers, thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Take care of yourselves and don't forget to keep looking up. <laughs>